yikes, the pressure's on. Uh, when Nancy asked me to chat with you all, I uh, thought I'd bit off more than I can chew. I mean, a doctor talking about caregiver might be a, a spouse who's taking care of their partner in the early stages of the disease, or maybe an adult child, typically a daughter, who's now caring for their parent in the middle stages of the disease, or maybe a nurse or a medical assistant who's now taking care of the patient with dementia in the later stages of the disease. But uh, I viewed this as a learning opportunity, and I wasn't aware that Nancy was going to reveal that um, I, I function, my wife and my family functioned as caregivers for, for my parents for a spell of time. And I found myself thinking about that the last few days and uh, how confusing it was for all of us and how I wished that somebody had an instruction book, much like I wished I'd, we'd gotten an instruction book when our first child was born. So uh, I'm going to give it a go, and I'll do the best I can. I was trained by Jesuits, and they always insist that before you begin a presentation, you have to tell a wee story. So you heard about the Irishman who hadn't gone to confession in many years. He decided to slip into the confessional box, and he noticed that on one wall of the box was a, a tap for Guinness beer. On the other side of the confessional box was a dazzling array of cigars and chocolates. And the priest slipped in, opened the confessional, and the Irishman said, Father, I haven't been to confession in a very long time, but I must admit you've dramatically changed the confessional box. And the priest said, Get out. You're on my side. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about is the other side, or what I'm going to talk about as a doctor is the other side, the other side of caregiving. And Nancy has kind of given me my mission, which is talking about specifically caregiver stress. So yesterday in Texas, we defined our future political opponents, okay? So the Jesuits always insist that whenever you do a presentation, you must define things first. So I'm going to use this magic box. I don't know if I have to signal the audio-visual people. And, and you're going to have to forgive me in advance. I'm not a slide kind of guy, so I'm going to do a little bit of writing here. So first off, let's talk about definition. And I have pretty primitive writing, typical of a doctor. So caregiver stress. Well, first off, what defines a caregiver? And I think it sort of depends on who you ask. But as I was doing my homework for this talk, the one thing that kind of leapt off the page in research studies is that the caregiver has to be someone who's with the Alzheimer's patient at least four hours a day, at least five days a week, for at least six months. Now, my hunch is that's probably a very modest definition of a caregiver. And for those of us who've provided that labor of love, it's quite a bit more than that. But we'll just start off because that's the minimum definition of caregiver. Now, what is the definition of stress? In my humble opinion, that's a word that our culture and our society uses ad lib. I mean, maybe it's one of the most overused words in our vocabulary. But I'm going to go to the well here. And the well is the original definition of stress from a medical point of view came from some elegant experiments in the 1950s by a physiologist named Hans Selye. And for those of you that are a little squeamish, you might want to close yours, but what he did basically was he shot rats experimentally and then he measured particular hormones that we think are associated with dramatic physiologic changes. Okay? And what 
Dr. Sellier discovered is that he defines stress as having three components. Alarm, arousal, and exhaustion. And it kind of comes in two forms, acute stress and chronic stress. So I'm a simple guy. Acute stress goes back to caveman days. You're padding down the track, you turn the corner, and there's a saber-toothed tiger, eh? Saber-toothed tiger, we see him, bang, our adrenal glands say, fight or flight, and we're off to the races, okay? That's acute stress. Alarm, arousal, and luckily safety and recovery, okay? We're, we're all accustomed to acute stress, but chronic stress, now there's a horse of a different color, horse of a different color. This is the steady drip, 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 minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, year by year, okay? You know, the easiest metaphor that I can think of are, are servicemen, you know, on vigilant duty 24 hours a day, day in, day out, and they return with post-traumatic stress disorder from this chronic stress. Well, let's translate this to Alzheimer's dementia, a chronic, progressive, degenerative illness that on average lasts from diagnosis to death 8 to 12 years. So this is by no means a sprint, a 100-yard dash. This is the ultra, ultra, ultra marathon. This is the drip, drip, drip of chronic stress, okay? So we've got a definition of caregiver, we've got a definition of stress. Let's move on a wee bit. I kind of like, again, I'm kind of like who, what, when, where, why, okay? So let's talk about epidemiology first, okay? This is simple. We know that Alzheimer's dementia is a disease in which the biggest risk factor is age. And we know in this country we've done a wonderful job of helping us live longer. Okay? So quite simply, the disease of Alzheimer's dementia, if you're 65 years old, percent of those folks will be vulnerable to Alzheimer's dementia. And every five years, that number doubles. So if you do your mathematics, by the time we are 80, we have approximately 50% chance of having this disease. Okay. There are currently 5.5 million people in our country of 320 million that meet diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's dementia. And if we just do simple, each of those folks needs at least a caregiver. We have a rough idea that five million other people are affected by this disease. Although, you know, that, that's a bit of, a, of an extrapolation for those folks that have late stage severe Alzheimer's dementia and then in a nursing home, an Alzheimer's specialty unit, they really have three caregivers, don't they? They have the morning shift, the mid shift, and the night shift. So here's one patient being cared for by three people. Imagine if you are the sole caregiver, you now have not one full-time job, but three full-time jobs. So just in terms of sheer numbers, five million and five and a half million people have the disease. And just simplifying it, if each of those patients has a caregiver, a spouse, an adult child, a nursing assistant, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, um, or a whole team in a facility, we're talking another five million at minimum, and maybe greater, okay? And you say, well, that's, that's a, an impressive number. But here's, here's where the, uh, the ominous age is the primary risk factor. And because we know our population is aging rapidly, you've all heard the predictions and the media that this is an illness that 